libraries. talk about hello welcome to the beautiful martin luther king jr memorial library i am so happy to see so many of your wonderful faces and i as an hu as a howard alum i am just extremely excited to introduce you guys and welcome you guys here today um if this isn't your first time here welcome if this is your return back welcome back um, we would like to say a big thank you to WABJ for promoting this event. And we also would like to say a big welcome to our, one of our wonderful bookseller partners, Loyalty Books. Um, yay. Let's... <laughs> wonderful black queer owned book, local bookseller here in DC. Um, and I just want to say that, um, the DC is a wonderful place for many reasons, but also because of its wonderful um, historically black university, Howard University. Um, it brings such a richness and such a value and brings so many great people to the city. And I think this book um, is definitely one that shares the value and then makes a good case for why we need to continue to support HBCUs. So, um, I would introduce our guest, but that's to another lovely person. Speaking of loyalty books, I would like to introduce Hannah Oliver Depp, and she will introduce our guest for the evening. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you back here again soon. Hi, y'all. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming out on a Monday evening, because it's Monday, but you made it. Thank you so much. 
my name is Hannah Oliver Depp. I'm the co-owner of Loyalty Bookstores. We are located in Petworth in Washington, D.C. and in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, my two home neighborhoods, so I'm so proud to have uh, black-owned bookstores back in my community that no matter how they change, we will always be there, right? Amen. Amen. I'm so proud to partner with the MOK Library. I, I know you got the library pitch, but I just want to reiterate, this is our library, this is our community, it's the space we make it. Please check out all the amazing exhibits, study here, do all, take advantage of everything. It's such an incredible thing, and our tax dollars paid for it, so let's enjoy it. <laughs> Um, we're so grateful that the library chooses to partner with independent bookstores to bring these book events out and it allows us to uh, fit way more than the, the 20 people that we can fit in our tiny store out here and bring together these events and attract these incredible authors to the space. Thank you for coming out. When you show up, it makes these authors come back, so I'm so grateful. Before I introduce uh, these incredible speakers, I'm going to just run through a little housekeeping and then I'll get out of the way. I know you're not here to see me. Um, please silence your cell phones. Yes, we forgot, we all got out of practice. <laughs> we went inside, we came back out, silenced those phones. You're very welcome to take photos, but please don't use flash. Uh, but do tag the library and the bookstore if you do. All righty, and of course, we will have time for Q&A at the end, but DC, I love you, but those are questions, not speeches. Uh, there's other people here who would like to ask questions, so let's keep it tight. Uh, so be thinking about those, take your notes, think through things, but we'll do Q&A at the end of this event. And now, of course, we are here to celebrate HBCU Made. I see a lot of Howard Swag in the audience, <laughs> so I know I'm talking to the right people. But I'm so excited because this collection really is a collection of beautiful essays and it truly does show not only the impact it has on people as an individual, but the larger communities that the schools are in and the generational impact it has on us as a people. So I am so excited for uh, these two fantastic authors to have this conversation, but also for these essays to get out into the world and show the beauty and the breadth and the depth of the HBCU experience. All right, now y'all know, but I'm gonna read the bios of these two incredible women our conversation partner tonight is the one and only Nicole Hannah-Jones, Pulitzer Prize winner creator of the 1619 Project, staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, and whose book version of the 1619 Project, as well as the 1619 Project children's book, Born on the Water, it was an instant New York Times bestseller. And of course, the six-part docuseries on Hulu just won an Emmy, okay, thank you. Uh, they are a MacArthur Fellow, they've won the Peabody Award, two George Polk Awards, National Magazine Award three times. She also serves as the Knight Chair of Race and Journalism at Howard University, where she founded the Center for Journalism and Democracy. Hannah Jones holds a Master of Arts in Mass and, uh, Communication from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and earned her Bachelor's in Arts History and African American Studies at University of Notre Dame, NBD. Please join me in welcoming our conversation partner, Nicole Hannah Jones. Woo! Oh, Wearing her fly Howard gear. And our woman of the hour, Aisha Roscoe, is host of NPR's Weekend Edition Sunday and the weekend episodes of Up First. Prior to her role as host, Roscoe was a White House correspondent and covered three presidential administrations. As part of the White House team, she was also a regular on the NPR Politics podcast. Before joining NPR, Roscoe spent the first decade of her career at Routers, rising from a newest assistant to energy reporter to eventually covering the White House. While at Routers, Roscoe covered some of the biggest energy environmental stories of the past decade, including the 2010 BP oil spill. She is a proud proud graduate of Howard University and is the author today of HBCU Made. Please join me in welcoming Ayesha Roscoe. Okay, how y'all feeling? Yeah. I really thought I was gonna see more HBCU gear here tonight. I'm a little disappointed. I, I see we I see, I see some. a little bit. I see some. It's just who, who do we have rock. represented here? I definitely see H U. <laughs> you know. Who else who else do we have? <laughs> Spellman. Spellman. Spellman, okay. Spellman. I'm an honorary Spellmanite. Where else? Yes. <laughs> Oh, okay, we don't we don't care about that age. We'll just playing, no, just playing, no, just playing. No, not no Hampton, no, no Hampton. <laughs> just bless playing. We it's all HBCU love. So I heard yes. Bethune. Who else? UDC, 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 fam. Okay. 
Southern. Megger Evers in Brooklyn. Okay. Wow. Hey, okay. Okay, so we are well represented tonight. Yes. Where? Okay, Tuskegee. <laughs> now, I don't want to start no fight up in here, yeah. y'all. Mm -mm. um, it's beautiful to see so many HBCUs mm -hmm. represented. It is beautiful to be in conversation with you. Congratulations you. on this book. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I know you will all have opportunity to purchase signed copies after you leave here, yes. but particularly in the times we're in, it's just so important to uplift uh, the work of HBCUs. Yes. Um, I don't know that any institutions in America have done more to kind of build uh, the black middle class, to help black people live up to our aspirations, to provide a space for us in a nation that has wanted to exclude us. So, um, you know, this really is a love song to HBCUs, yeah. and I'm so excited to talk to you about it tonight. Um, so in the, um, the preface for the book, The Introduction, you kind of tell the story of your HBCU journey, yeah. how you ended up choosing to come to the Mecca. Yes, um, yes. But also that you always kind of knew HBCUs might might be in yeah. your future. So tell your HBCU okay. story. So like I, I, you know, growing up, I was incredibly shy, very introverted. I, you know, and I just felt like I needed to get away. I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. I felt like I needed to leave the state and I would be able to maybe, you know, shed some of that shyness and really develop as who who I am. And so I was looking outside of, um, I actually did apply to UNC Chapel Hill. I got in, but that was too close. And then I applied to Howard and I applied to Ithaca. Now I don't know why I applied to Ithaca. I can't really explain that, what was going on in my teenage head. But Howard, um, you know, my mother went to Winston-Salem State University. Eventually, my sister, who's in the audience, she also went to Winston-Salem State University. Um, and so I had a lot of family that had went there. So I knew about HBCUs. I remember going to homecoming and seeing the majorettes and seeing, you know, just seeing the culture. Um, but I really, like, when I thought of Howard, I felt like it was kind of a cool place. Like, to me, it was the place where I felt like I could have, um, you know, when you look at the people who've been there, whether it's Toni Morrison, whether it's Felicia Rashad, whether it's Thurgood Marshall, like it just had an eliteness that I was like, I wanna be a part of that. And then it also just seemed like it was in DC and it was cool and I wasn't cool. And I wanted to be there and see if I could get some of that coolness. So that's how I ended up at Howard. So you talk about that you, um, this, this actually was kind of a tender moment reading mm. your introduction. You said you didn't really have friends no. in high school, <laughs> which I was like, that's brave to admit. <laughs> yeah. I don't, that might have been true, but I wouldn't have put it in the book. You wouldn't have put it in the book. You know, people, and people have been like, is that really true? I was like, no, it was just me and Jesus. That's, that's all I had. Like, I didn't, I didn't have friends like that, not outside of school. So I was very lonely, right? And so when my family thought of me going to D.C., which was like the big city, and going to this school, they were just like, can you really make it? And they also felt like I didn't have no street sense, which I didn't. And, you know, I'm very sure sheltered country girl like are you going to be able to make it in the big city of DC rough and tumble area um, can you survive and I didn't know either like I thought like to me I really was a questioning like would I survive <laughs> like would I live through four years but when I got to Howard it didn't happen overnight I was still scared to death but over time, I think part of what I got is that I could survive, right? Like I was a lot stronger than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. It's funny because, so I lived in Durham for yeah. almost six years. Okay. Um, I lived there when I went to graduate school, then I worked at the News and Observer and covered Dur Durham Public Schools. And Durham is not, I mean, Durham, Oh, well, you know, Durham, Durham is rough. Durham yeah, yeah, no, rough no, too. no, Durham is rough now. You know, I grew up in Durham, but I have a lot of family in Oxford, so they will always be like, we're not going to Durham. It's too rough over there. <laughs> So yeah, no, it was rough, but it wasn't anything compared to DC. And the Shaw neighborhood in that moment was very different than the Shaw neighborhood that you see right now. So at that point, it was a very different type of environment. 
And yet Howard was this oasis, right? Yeah. I mean, when you, when, you, when you think about the number of luminaries that came mm -hmm. out of an institution like Howard, but also just HBCUs in general, yeah. um, I imagine that is part of what led you to want to write this book. So why don't you yeah. talk about, you know, it's called HBCU Made. It's a collection of essays by uh, people uh, across various professions mm -hmm. who went to an HBCU um, and, and the impact that the HBCUs had on them. So what made you want to write this book? Well, you know, Algonquin, the publisher of the book, came to me and they were like, would you want to pull together this collection? First of all, I was shocked that this didn't already exist. Like when they said that no major publishing company had the stories of HBCU graduates in their own words talking about the importance of these institutions. So when they said they, that didn't exist, I was like, well, this long overdue. Like this should have been done long ago. Um, I said, let me think about it, because I had just started at Weekend Edition. And I was like, ah, you know, I got a lot going on. Um, I got these three kids. I got a lot happening in my life. Um, but I thought about it for a month, and then I was like, you know, I got to do this. Because I thought about how Howard had impacted my life and how it had really set me on a course. And then I thought about, like, all of these people from all of these different generations and different career paths and like how all of these people had gotten their start at HBCUs and how the world is better for it. And I wanted this book to be that love song, that love letter to HBCUs to say HBCUs have made the world a better place and continue to make the world a better place. And so that's what I wanted this book to be. So can you tell me a bit about how did you select the essayists in the book? And there's a wide range, you know, Roy Wood, a comedian, yes. you yeah. have writers, you have uh, Stacey Abrams. So how did you pick um, who you wanted to be in the book? I wanted, a, I wanted there to be like a wide range of perspectives. So I wanted people from different generations. So some people that are maybe a little more seasoned. And then I wanted some of the younger people. The youngest person in the book, Brandon Gilpin, is an actor. He graduated from Morehouse in 2021. Um, so he's the youngest person in the book. I also, it was really important from the very beginning that I didn't just want the Howards and the Morehouses and the Spellmans, like, because there are a hundred HBCUs in this country and a lot of them do not have the name recognition. They don't get the attention. They're not necessarily getting the donation. So I wanted to make sure that we had the Dillards and the Talladegas and, you know, even so, like some of those schools that don't get all the, the name recognition. Recognition. Um, and so I wanted, that was very important to me. And I wanted people who had come from, you know, some first generation college students, some who had grown up on the college campus. It was also really important to me to have the perspective of an LGBTQ person to talk about that experience on an HBCU campus. And so I wanted a wide range. So I want to talk about some of the, the essays and, and some of the themes that get tackled in the essays. So um, in Roy Wood Jr.'s, he went to FAM, and he talks about how, uh, so he engaged in some slight credit card fraud. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah, so, yeah he says it's like stealing de jeans from dealers, but it was, it was well, complicated. It was, some, it was some credit card yeah. fraud. <laughs> yeah. um, and he, he gets put out of uh, Fam Damn for you. doing that, yeah. but then Fam takes him back, back. Yeah. right? And he really says that he believes his career and his success was because he went to an institution that believed in second chances, yeah. that allow black people to have a margin of error that we so seldom have, yeah. right? Yeah. White youth can make mistakes yes. and yeah. recover, we often can't. Yeah. So that was his story. Talk to me a bit about that essay and that role yeah. that HBCUs play, which we know um, HBCUs serve a lot of students who are first gen. Mm -hmm. um, about two thirds of students at HBCUs are Pell Grant eligible, which yeah. means they, they live at the poverty line. Mm -hmm. So HBCUs, you know, we think about elite black folks when we think mm -hmm. sometimes about a place like Spelman or Howard, but even the majority of students at Howard yeah. are low income. Yeah, yeah. So this role that HBCUs play specifically in taking 
those students who would mm -hmm. otherwise be left behind or mm -hmm. who are made to believe that they're not college material. Yeah. That really is what HBCUs do. And that, that was a through line that I saw over and over in the book and that, I, I, that stood out to me was this idea of redemption. And I think Roy Wood Jr.'s story was a perfect example of that where he talks about he messed up. He made this huge mistake and then he had to go to his professors and ask them to vouch for him to give him a second chance. And then because he got that second chance, now we have Ray Wood Jr. You know, hosting the White House Correspondents' Dinner. We're seeing him at the Emmys because there was a sense of redemption, right? And then we also have some, you know, lesser known names in the book, but, you know, that talk about Marquise Brown, he's a digital marketer, and he talks about how, you know, when he got into Hampton, you know, he got in, but he was, he had to take classes because his scores had been too low, so he, you know, had kind of messed up in high school, had had some professors, some high school teachers who didn't believe in him, and when he got to Hampton, he says he had a black male mathematician as his tutor. And that seeing that black male mathematician in that position meant so much to him. And it also gave him space to feel like he wasn't being looked down upon. He wasn't being looked at, at as inferior, but he could learn and then he ends up graduating from Hampton with honors. So HBCUs absolutely give a chance to, as you said, to people who would have fallen through the cracks. And then we see the benefits from giving those chances to give people an education. Yeah, I think, I think that's such an important point. I was arguing on Twitter with someone, which I occasionally do. <laughs> you uh, Just a little bit. Every once in a while. <laughs> Um, and someone said, HBCUs are where black students go if they can't get any, in anywhere else. Mm, 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 mm. And one that told me a lot about the type of person who needs to believe that. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because you can't possibly believe one would choose a black institution. Mm -hmm. um, but I also said, that's actually not a bad thing. Mm. Right? Mm. That there are so many students who are deserving yeah. of an opportunity yeah. to achieve higher ed. And if you weren't a stellar academic student mm -hmm. um, in high school, we shouldn't write you off. And that's yeah. what HBCUs really do. Yeah. One of my first stories for the New York Times Magazine was about Xavier yeah. University in uh, New Orleans and how they send more undergraduates to become black doctors and any other institution, often tied with Spelman and Howard. Yeah. But all of these vaunted white institutions are not sending as many black students on to become doctors as a handful of HBCUs. Yeah. And I profiled this doctor out of Chicago um, who was a brilliant student but went to a high school that didn't even have a chemistry Mm. or physics class, mm -hmm. he graduated without ever having been exposed even to the periodic table, mm. and yet he wants to be a doctor. So if he goes to a white school, he doesn't become a doctor. Yeah. But yeah. he goes to Xavier, and Xavier takes this young man and says, we will remediate you. Mm -hmm. We understand you have the intellect, you just haven't had the preparation. Yeah. And so when people dismiss HBCUs as that, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the beauty and the mission of HBCUs is to see the full potential of black mm -hmm. folks, yes. but to understand that we come out of a country that systemically disadvantages us, yeah. and that we're more yeah. than what our academic paperwork might say. Well, and, and so many times the potential is there, but, you know, and I think, you know, Marquise's story is a very good example of it, you know, of someone says something to you, a teacher who says to you like, oh, well, I know I don't expect much of you. And then they say, okay, well, I'm, I won't give you much, right? Like if you have people constantly telling you that you are not going to achieve, right? Like then you live up to that, right? But what HBCUs do is they give you a chance to counteract that, that, that message, that narrative that is told to you over and over again, that you are not worthy, are you smart, how did you get in here, did you get in through the back door? Like, I mean, you know, that's the whole thing. But it allows you to be a full human being and to say, okay, I'm, I'm here and I'm worthy and what can I be? Instead of feeling like you're immediately shackled. So, Honoré uh, Jeffers, yes. who wrote, if y'all have not read mm. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, it's yes. an amazing book. It's also like yes. three Bible lengths long, yeah. so <laughs> might take you a while to work through it. Yeah. Um, so she wrote an essay, mm -hmm. and Stacey Abrams wrote an mm -hmm. essay. And two of the things that really stick out to me are mm -hmm. the, the themes of uh, kind of 
the liberatory experience of an HBCU. Yeah. So yeah. Stacey Abrams says that, like our sister institution, Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, we'd come to Spelman to immerse ourselves in a singular experience, one where race and gender cease to be wielded as weapons against us or used to justify questions about our capacity. Mm -hmm. So what she's saying is that by going as a black woman yeah. to a school for black women, mm -hmm. she could actually just experience herself as a human being. Yes, yes. And not have to worry about being gendered, being racialized, mm -hmm. but could actually experience herself as a full human being. Can yeah. you talk about that and, and, and how the experience of an HBCU gives black students that feeling, which we often never get to never feel? Get. Yeah, I mean, I thought what was so interesting about her um, essay too is she talked about how at Spelman, she didn't have to be expected to argue from the black woman perspective. That often when you are in a place where you're the only one, it's like, oh, so you're arguing the black woman perspective. But there's a reality, like when you're in a space like that, where it's like, oh, black people have, lots of different viewpoints and like we we don't all think the same and we can and I can have thoughts and and think about things like as you said just as a human being I think that like so often this idea of like what authority is is rooted in this you can look at it's usually like a white male but at an HBCU you can see all of these scholars and all of it I mean you can see you know uh, a Nicole Hannah Jones right and you can see people who look like you standing up, teaching you, and then you go, I can be an authority too. I can be an authority the way I sound, with my accent, in my blackness, with my braids, with my locks. And I think that it expands instead of contracts this idea of what authority must look like and sound like. And it doesn't seem surprising to you the way it is when you're out in the world that, oh, you know things. Oh, you're worthy to be listened to. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it seems to me that these are spaces where you actually have the freedom to just be. Yeah. And as someone who unfortunately made the terrible decision of going to a PWI. <laughs> we forgive you, we forgive you, we forgive you. I didn't know any better. <laughs> um, you know, to, to think about when you are in these environments mm -hmm. that clearly are not created for you, they're not created for your success, where every day in the classroom you feel like you have to represent your entire race, yes. yeah. that you cannot show, you know, you can't even show that you don't understand something yeah. because you feel if you ask a question, It'll just be proof that it's a weight. you're not deserving. Yeah, it's right, a weight that that holds you down, yeah. right? Like it's a weight that feel that, and I think a lot of times we don't even recognize it because it's so a part of life that is something that you don't even re recognize till you're out of that space, and then you see the difference. And you see that, and people wrote in the book, Nicole Perkins, an author and poet, she talked about how she went to Dillard in undergrad, but then she went to a, a, you know, a predominantly white institution for graduate school. And it was, you know, when she was in this, these classes, she was getting questioned, like, how do you know this? And she would be the only person <laughs> being asked, like, how did you come up with this answer? You know, like, the, she says that she didn't have, at Dillard, it wasn't that she wasn't challenged, but she didn't have to just justify her ability to think that's such like a basic thing yeah yeah <laughs> but to be black in America that is a rare thing yeah. um, and and I think a lot about you know I know when I was coming up you would hear folks say well don't go to an HBCU because that's not the real world yeah 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 and I used to think well we're gonna be in the real world our whole lives <laughs> So can we get four years, yes. <laughs> right, of, yeah. of, of getting that armor to go mm -hmm. out into the world of, of professors who pour into you, who have no yeah. doubt about your capabilities, of classmates. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're at Howard, I, I sit in my office in the undergraduate library and I'm like, oh, everybody's studying, you know, for the chemistry course. They're all mm -hmm. black. Yeah. Everybody on the chess team, they're black. Every, mm -hmm. Right? It's like every whole experience you want to have, mm -hmm. you're not the only one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Talk about what that experience is like for a black woman trying to find herself in America. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that is such an important point. And like this idea that HBCUs don't offer a real world experience. You know, actually in the book, the other through line that I saw over and over again was the diversity of the HBCU experience. That, you know, you go to an HBCUs, and so many people wrote about how they go to an HBCU and then they see that there are black people from all over the world, right? That not only all over the country, but all over the world from the continent of Africa, from the Caribbean, there are very rich, you know, society type black people who some are in Martha's Vineyard. They are the, you know, the people who are first generation, um, you know, college students and everything in between. Um, you know, we have a great story from Lauren F. Ellis who does like a lot of special effects for all the big movies that you watch like Aquaman and stuff. And she talks about being on Hampton's campus and on the first day running into her first black Republican. And she <laughs> <laughs> she had never met a black Republican before. There, there are all sorts of people, right, on HBCU campuses. It is not monolithic. It's not everybody doesn't think the same. And you learn that. I think that what I got at Howard especially was, oh, like the black experience is not one experience. I'm from the South, but there are black people from the West Coast, from all, you know, from all over the place. So I have a very specific experience, but it doesn't speak for everyone. And there are a lot of people who do not think like me, right? Like, so I think that what I learned is this idea that there's something um, about being black that is just like, oh, well, you know, all black people do this or that. I immediately know you know nothing about black people because all black people don't do this or that, right? Like we are all unique and different. Um, and so I think that's what was rooted in me at Howard University. So what I also appreciated about the book is that um, you also, folks also felt free to critique yeah. the shortcomings of mm -hmm. some HBCUs um, or HBCUs in general, right? That no institution is, is perfect. And uh, Michael Arsenal writes about what it was like to be a gay man yeah. um, on an HBCU campus at Howard. And he talks about a student named Daryl Payton mm -hmm. who gets nearly beaten to death yeah. um, um, be because of homophobia on yeah. campus and was really critiquing then mm -hmm. how HBCUs are still failing to serve people who are marginalized even within our, mm -hmm. within our own communities. Can yes. you talk about that I, and why know, that was important as well? I, as a journalist, I when I was putting this book together, I knew that I did not want it to be PR. I did not want it to be fluff. I, I do not feel like, um, I wanted it to be a love letter, but I do not feel like love um, is without challenge or complication. I feel like if you love something, then you should call it to be accountable and you should want it to be the absolute best that it can be. And so I wanted to have uh, stories that also were more complicated and maybe even critical um, because I think that, you know, the story of Michael Arsenault and, and the stories that he told is to say, look, HBCUs can be a safe place, but they're not a safe place for everyone, right? And that there are black people with, as you said, with marginalized identities who have been under attack. And I think he did point out that progress has been made, but still he says, like, is it enough? And he wants to, he wants um, HBCUs to love him as much as he loves it, right? Um, and I think that it was important to have that voice and it was important to not try to sugarcoat things. I also think the great thing about HBCUs is that when you really educate people and you tell them that they are worthy and that they are, you know, that their voices matter, then they push for more. And you see that at Howard's campus, you see you protests. You know we see that at Howard, we yeah. get protested every day. <laughs> yeah, you see, you see the protests, you see it was Howard students that, you know, who took over the administration building and got the African American History Department. I think that when you educate free black people and you really want them to be free, then you see that they push to even make, to say when HBCUs do not um, live up to their potential and they push back against the status quo. And I think that's what H HBCUs equip their students to do. 
Yeah, and, and, and there does seem to be something fundamentally different about protesting an institution yeah, and, and, that and you there does know seem to be something fundamental for you, for you, even if yes. it's not fully meeting your needs. Yeah. Versus, so often we're protesting institutions that weren't built for us, mm. will never be built for us, um, and you know, would just outlast us with the same issues that they always had. I think it is different because I think it does come from a place of love, right? Like it comes from a place of, I know what this place can be. And I know that you can be more, and like I said, it's the very tools that you are providing me with that are making me question some of the things that I'm being told. I mean, you know, when I went to Howard, it wasn't unusual to be told, well, make sure you don't wear braids to your interviews, make sure you, make sure you don't wear your natural hair and all of that. And I'm glad that people have pushed back against that. And now you have the Crown Act and other things because people were realizing like, wait a minute, why can't I show up as I am? And it is a complicated walk to walk because obviously HBCU and the people who were saying that were saying, look, this is the real trying world. You, right? They were trying to help. They were saying, look, this I'm trying to get you a job. But there's, so it's the push and the pull of dealing with the world as it exists and then also trying to make the world a better place. So for a while after desegregation, right? So of course HBCUs come out of a history of exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, they came from a time where we didn't have options. Yeah. And then the blessing and the curse of integration, of course, mm -hmm. is we now had options mm -hmm. and many black people were no longer choosing HBCU. So mm -hmm. we saw declining enrollment. They were always underfunded, but then yeah. because HBCUs don't have endowments, they don't tend to have the big donors, so much of their financial viability was based on tuition, how many yeah. students were enrolled. But post-Trump, we've actually seen a rise in enrollment at HBCUs, and many HBCUs are witnessing record enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about kind of what you see as the future of HBCUs now and, and the role that HBCUs need to continue to play? I think, there's, I think there are a number of things at play here. I think you can look at, you know, po post George Floyd in 2020 and the, the conversations that were going on around that time and, and before and after then about supporting the institutions that are actually made for black people and the question of, well, why are we sending our students or sending our athletes leads to these predominantly white schools and not sending them to these schools that are made for black people. I think there's also, I mean, I love Beyonce. I think Beachella had something to do with it. You know, I, that's just me. I don't have no empirical evidence of it, but I think it has something to do with it. And then you see Kamala Harris, right? A Howard graduate, vice president of the United States. I think all of these things come together and you get a focus on HBCUs and this realization. Number one, I think when you look at it like a Kamala Harris, so it's, it's a perfect example of this idea that HBCUs do not limit you. There are lots of connections that you make as an HBCU grad, even with not just within your school, but just being an HBCU grad. When you meet other HBCU grads who are doing amazing things, there's a connection and a kinship um, and that you know just like there's an Ivy League connection and kinship there's an HBCU connection and kinship and I think that people are realizing that more but I do think um, that we cannot lose sight of the fact that there are still a lot of schools struggling right like the smaller schools that don't get a hundred million dollars it's, it's awesome that Spelman got a hundred million dollars um, but a lot of schools that do, a lot of HBCUs that do not have that name recognition um, are having struggles, right, even now. And I think we do have to remember that. Yeah, I mean, I, I really wish we could, as a people, have an ethos of giving. Yeah. And, and we do give, actually. When you, when you look at the, the statistics, black alum do give, give back to yes. their HBCUs. We just mm -hmm. have less to give. Yes. Right? That's the thing. So, yeah. But also, you know, you look at someone like a Dr. Dre who decides when he wants to give, you know, whatever, the $100 million he gave yeah. to USC. <laughs> well. And I'm thinking... <laughs> What could that money have done for HBCU? But we're giving for prestige, not for mm -hmm. impact, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we, not so much with 
uh, our regular everyday folks who yes. do give yeah. back uh, to HBCUs, but building that eth ethos of building black institution amongst mm -hmm. the black elites who seem to want to derive so much status mm -hmm. from being associated with white institutions. When, when you look at who's producing the most black doctors, black lawyers, mm -hmm. black dentists, black STEM scientists, black judges, right? Uh, like, yeah. HBCUs are have always punched above their weight with less resources. Yeah. Yeah. And what this tells you is that it's all a game because if you really thought we wouldn't compete, you wouldn't have to under resource us yes. and we still wouldn't compete. But the mm -hmm. fact that we're able to do it with less means if we actually had what we deserved, yeah. what could we accomplish then? Exactly. No, I, I think it's I think it's so important. And you know, I mean I hope the book can play a little role in that, but I think that it's also I think it's people like you, I think it's Stacey Abrams going to Howard, I think Branford Marsalis is down at in North Carolina Central. I think it's black Black elites making the choice to go. I'm not elite, y'all. Don't put me in that category. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm sad, but going to. I'm <laughs> No, but going to HBCUs and saying this is a place that is worthy of support. Um, Branford Marsalis says in the book, he says, um, you know, I could have gone to any school in the country, and they said, why would you go to this HBCU? And he says, it's about the culture. Like he, he's like, I don't even understand the question. He went to Southern. He, it, it was like he could have went to Juilliard, but he said he wanted to march in the marching band. He wanted to learn that. Um, so I think that it's about you know being um, willing to say like, look, these are places that are worthy of our support. They are worthy of celebration. And so many people have come out of these schools, and it's about giving back just a little bit of what they've given to us. Absolutely. So I'm just going to ask one more question and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, so having put this book out into the world um, with so many both well-known, less well-known, but people for whom their lives would not be what they are without HBCUs, what would you say is the enduring message that you hope is sent by uh, this book HBCU made? You know, I think that I go back to this idea of um, educating free black people and what that means expansively. Like this idea that HBCUs have offered a place of liberation and freedom for black people who are so often confined and restricted and not allowed to be what they fully could be and that these spaces offer, um, a, they're an incubator that allow them to develop their voice, their talents, and that it is not just the black community that is served by that. Like when black people are not invested in, the world suffers. This is not just about, oh, this will help black people. No, you are missing out by not developing this talent. And so I hope that people will look at this book and see it as a testament to what can happen when you give black people a chance and pour into them. And that these HBCUs, as I said, are worthy of celebration and support because they do make the world a better place. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Hand and our amazing, oh, I gotta stop projecting so loud, the mic's on. <laughs> uh, our fantastic, Friends of the library here are going to bring mics around. And I'm told if you don't shy. ask a question, they will cut your microphone off. Yeah. That's what I heard. <laughs> I mean, I'm harsh, y'all. Yes. I'm not going to lie. I know we're not shy here. I know. <laughs> I've never, I know there got to be some questions. What? <laughs> oh, this is, oh, okay. oh there There's we go. One. I love yeah, you, girl. Start it up. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much. I appreciated you all's talk today. Um, I wanted to speak about the culture of giving at HBCUs. Um, we spoke about how we don't have the same type of pockets, I guess, to um, endow our institutions as uh, predominantly white schools. How do you propose that we can create that shift, especially when some of 
our HBCUs have encountered um, situations in which leadership may not have been as transparent as necessary mm. um, to, I guess, foster that type of trust to want to um, give our coins to um, our institutions? Mm. You know, I think I don't. I don't have the perfect answer to that. I mean, I would say that it's that HBCUs, like any other institution, can have financial issues, issues with how the money is being dealt with, and things like that. Um, and some, you know, would probably argue that they get um, more attention than other institutions who probably have the same issues. Um, but I, I, I do think that it's important to have these discussions and to really push for um, for donations, to push for like a larger um, look at. I think like giving $100 million to Spellman is a huge thing and I think that it will benefit other HBCUs because when you see that level of giving and you see the impact of that, then that definitely opens the door to more people giving that and saying, okay, this is something that I would want to do. Um, I, but I think that it's a conversation that has to keep happening. Um, and I think that as far as like whether the institutions can live up to the money, I think first, you know, first give them the money first and see what happens, you know? <laughs> like they, they haven't even been given a chance most of the time. Give them the money first and see what happens. Um, and, and, and then I think you can hold people account if the money is not spent well. Hmm. So we've got one here okay. and one here. Let's start with you, sir. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Raphael. Love hearing you on the radio. <laughs> Thank the you. best <laughs> part of the week. Oh. But um, I'm a teacher here in DC. I'm also a Howard alum. Mm. So I've been teaching my students about HBCUs and why they're important and incorporating it with math. I was talking about the marching band and such. I bring all that together to say, with this book, who is your initial audience, right? So in my classroom, for the schools that I taught here in DC, I always talk about HBCUs. I talk about the importance of that, right? Mm -hmm. And I try my hardest to bring them to Howard and just expose them to other HBCUs, students that are black and non-black, right? Um, so with this book, who is your audience? Well, I mean, so I think that obviously, like I would say my audience first is everyone, but I think obviously there's a, an audience in high schoolers, people who are looking at what they want, uh, where they want to go to school. Like, I, I think this book is written in very plain language, and it's really people telling their individual stories. And so I wanted it to be very accessible. It's not a research tome or anything like that. It is people telling their stories that are very relatable about why they decided to go to an HBCU, why it made a difference in their life. And so I think for a student, I would have loved to have a book like this and it would have maybe made me a little less scared you know when I was going to Howard to see that there were people like me there were people who were scared there were people who were nervous there were people who you know were just going who were just living life uh, from different experiences and so I think that this book definitely has an audience and you know those students who are you know rising up and deciding what school they want to go to and so absolutely I do think that it is a broader audience because these are very human stories. It's about institutions, but these institutions are made up of human beings. And so really what these stories are is about people f coming to their own and figuring out who they are. And I think that's a universal story. Mm -hmm. Hello. Gratitude for you being here and your presence and this book. I have my 10 year old sunshine here with me and uh, he was recently having a conversation with his parents and he said he's interested in Howard University specifically because he knows that it is one of the most expensive HBCUs and <laughs> expense equals that it must be good. Mm. How do we mm. counter some of those things because you do mention namesake. Mm -hmm. um, and you do mention name recognition. How do we start to look at the other, say, 95 institutions that exist beyond the ones that we consistently speak about so that we can talk to our youth to make um, just more informed decisions? And I'm asking this as an educator who's been in higher education 
for over 20 years. So I know what I would say. You yeah. don't want to hear it from mama. <laughs> what would you yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you know, obviously higher education in this country is extremely expensive. And, you know, when you have private universities uh, like Howard University, um, uh, the cost can be quite high. I think the thing about it is there are a lot of state schools um, and state HBCUs um, that are less expensive. There are a lot. I think that part of, you know, what I wanted to do with this book, you know, as I said, is that even though I love Howard, and to me, it is the place to be. And look, you can get scholarships. Tell yourself, I, you know, I went on a full ride. You can get scholarships, but I, I understand that people need a lot more options than just Howard and the, the, the biggest schools, and especially money matters, right? Um, but you can get a good education going to a smaller HBCU, and there are a lot of people who have gone to smaller HBCUs and have done in incredible things. Um, and I think pointing that out and letting, letting people know that um, is important because I do think that if you really want HBCUs to thrive, you can't just focus on one or two of them. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a question down here. And one over there. Yeah. Hi, um, Hi, my name is Taylor. I'm a junior at Duke Ellington and I major in museum studies. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question would just be like, when I'm talking to curators and art historians who are black, they say how hard it was to get into a male white dominated field coming from an HBCU. And I guess what would your advice be for me as somebody who wants to go to an HBCU, but also wants to go into a career that's dominated by white men? Mm. I mean, I think that's a that's a tough question. Um, good question. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, I and I don't want to sugarcoat it. I mean, I think that oftentimes a lot of careers that we go into are going to be dominated by white men. Um, and I do think the fact that you're talking to black curators who went to HBCUs tells you that there is a path, even if it is more difficult. Um, and so I, I, I would say that sometimes like going the, the path that is less straight can still offer you so many opportunities. Um, and like I said, I don't want to sugarcoat it and make it seem like everything's just great. Um, but you know, going to Howard University, that's how I got introduced to Reuters, which was, you know, a newswire, which, you know, had, has a lot of white people there. Let's just be <laughs> real. <laughs> you know, but I got, but they oftentimes, you know, these, in, you know, these institutions are looking to diversify. So they partner with HBCUs because they're looking for talent. And, you know, there was a class, Reuters partnered with Howard for a class, and that's how they um, saw my work. Like, I did not qualify to go to the Reuters internship. Everybody else there had interned at the Wall Street Journal. I had interned at the Winston-Salem Journal. And so, I, you know, but they saw my actual work and they knew that I could do it, right? So it wasn't a matter of my ability. It was just a matter of, like, access. Um, and so I wouldn't be discouraged. Like, if it's really important to you to go to an HBCU, I really believe your talent will make space for you. Like, I'm not saying that it'll be easy, but I do believe that you can find a path for yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we got a question down here, and we've got questions over there. Hi. Hi. Um, your response to one of the questions was, like, you begin to find yourself at an HBCU, and I wanted to know what you found out about yourself. Ooh, Why that's a good college? question. Are you a journalism major? <laughs> yeah. I was. Me and my friend Kari, we were journalism majors at that Howard. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think what I found out about myself, I found out a lot of things. Um, you know, when I went to Howard, like I said, I was very shy, very soft spoken, very timid. It did not change overnight. Um, but I did find that I was more resourceful than I thought I was. I was scared, but I would do it scared. So I would do the work scared. I was scared to go up to people. I was, I didn't like, you know, people being mad at what I was reporting, but I kept doing it. And so what I learned about myself is that even though I'm scared to death, there's a part of me that's like, I'm not going to stop. 
You're not gonna tell me that I can't do this. I'm gonna show you. Like, give me the opportunity. Give me the ball, I'm gonna do it. Um, and so that's what I learned. Now, I, like, I always say, and what I've said in this journey of doing the book, is that the seeds were planted. They didn't sprout there, but I think that the person that you see now, the seeds were planted at Howard University, and now you see the fruit of it. But it, was, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Um, and it, it also showed me um, that there's just a greater context to the world that we live in. And so that, you know, when people are attacking me because, like, the way I talk, I don't sound like everybody else, and I got an accent, and this and the, why you pronounce your words this way, I can say, like, you know, that's not really about me. Like, this is a large, you're not really responding to me. You're just responding to the fact I don't sound how you think I should sound. And it really doesn't have anything to do with me. And that was definitely something that I got at Howard University. Oof. Okay. Good, yeah, there and then there. Good Go evening. Ahead. Thank you for sharing. Could you talk about the stories that did not make it in this book? Oh my goodness. So <laughs> I think like so I think, you know, the stories that made it in the book most, I mean, I think most of the stories made it in the book. I mean, we did have to cut some things for for time, you know, for space. But usually, it's actually kind of hard to get people to write like four thousand words. So sometimes, usually, we were asking for more. Give us more. Give us more. I think for me, um, I probably could have talked all day about. Um, working at the Hilltop, the student newspaper at Howard University. So we did have to cut some of that out because they were like, look, this is, this is about your journalism experience. We need to focus more on HBCUs. Um, but yeah, like I think that like we really tried to get people to drill in on a lot of times on like the pivotal moment, right? Like, or, or like a pivotal part of the HBCU experience. Um, and so that's what we really tried to, to get people to narrow down on. Hello? Hi, I think I wasn't sure if it was on. So I'm wondering if in your research and in writing this and gathering the stories, if you were able to find out about sorting and mating, since there's so many connections at HBCUs, and if it's easier for people to mate there, and if that would give people more um, in terms of also donating back to the schools and to the HBCU system. You mean, what do you, you mean like people coupling up and stuff? Yeah, marriages. Okay, oh, marriages. People yeah, did talk sorting. about <laughs> Okay, I was trying to be, <laughs> I was right. like, what? That's an academic like, term. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, well, you know, a lot of the, the kid, a lot of the people in the book, um, Roy Wood Jr. is a, a, an example of this. His parents met at FAMU, um, and that's how Roy Wood Jr. came into the world. And so I, <laughs> you know, and there are a lot of stories about that, and Nicole Perkins, um, um, essay also touches on this idea of, and you know, so does Leonita Inges, who she's a, a public radio um, host. She talks about you know all the 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 marriages and the the connections that come from that, and how and and her essay is really a great example of generations. Her father went to um, FAMU, and I believe her mother did as well. And so she really has generations, um, and you know, her uncles and this. And so this idea of like it really being a family thing, right? Like you have your kids, and then your kids' kids. I mean, I think that's definitely a part of the experience, and, and you get that delved into in the book, you know. I mean, I think it works for some people, right? So I, I think it's it's an important part of the story. Mm. All right, y'all, gotta save the rest of your questions for our signing line. <laughs> but uh, we do have copies of HBC Made up top, and they are all signed, but if you want a personalization, you wanna get it as a gift for someone, get a special treat for yourself, Aisha has offered to do a personalization signing line up at the top. So. That's an option, but for now, please join me in giving a round of applause and a thank you to Nicole Hannah-Jones and Aisha Roscoe. Woo! You did it! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see y'all up top. Thank you, and thank you to the MLK Library for hosting. Woo -woo. Yeah, y'all need me to take some photos for you? Let's get some photos. Aww.
I saw you stream and I was like, who's on there? This is work. That's this work. Thank you. Oh, you got a sharp. Careful, people see.